And we are live on here today. Welcome, everyone. This is the observance and the special uh, awareness episode, live episode here of the podcast to answer your questions about addiction and mental health. Brought to you by the uh, Wisen Method and Domus Retreat. And I am your co-host, Dwight Hurst. So glad to be here uh, to, to observe International Overdose Awareness Day. And I'm joined here, as as always, by uh, Claire Wiseman and David Livingston, except here we are in live video action for the world to see. <laughs> hey, guys. Hi. How are you, Dwight? Hi, I'm Dwight. doing okay. Yeah. Hi, David. How are you? Good, we, good. Um, we are meeting me... here. Go ahead, uh, Claire, you start. No, just glad to be here in a, such an important day. Um I think uh, awareness is the beginning of uh, you know, this healing um, that is so incredibly needed with this opioid crisis, um, hundreds of people dying a day just in the United States. So this is an international day and I don't want to forget you know, mm -hmm. the whole world that is suffering this um, terrible tragedy as we are. Yes. But um, I think uh, awareness, education, um, you know, talking about it um, without judgment, um, without stigma is incredibly important. And I think the only way we're going to fix this crisis is if we truly understand um, that drugs are a consequence and not the issue. Mm -hmm. It's an excellent thing. One of the things I know that this day was organized for is is to have that focus of remembering those that have died and you you said two of the main words which is without stigma right um and i know one of the thrusts of the message of of the wiseman method and the podcast that we're doing is that the stigma is really it's not necessary and it's not important and it's not it's important in that it's bad is what i mean but when we feel that stigma being applied to ourselves or to others especially those who have been lost in this crisis, we completely take out several things, one of which is simply the medical nature of addiction, which is that, uh, you know, we, do we judge those that die of a heart attack as all the things that we judge someone who dies of an overdose? And then, of course, with this crisis and epidemic, we also take out the fact that uh, people might be using something that, while it might be self-destructive and not technically responsible from a healthy perspective, uh, they don't know that it's poisoned, by the way. That's also part of it with the fentanyl uh, being present. So there's a lot of things with that stigma. They're very damaging, obviously. Yeah. And, and again, if if we are if this day is to, um, you know, remember those that passed, I think um, to make um, their death, you know, uh, to make their, their lives important more than the, their deaths is to. Um, help others not end up with the same fate and uh, have uh, people understanding that uh, people use drugs most of the time. And when I say most, it's almost all the time to uh, treat pain, emotional pain, physical pain, regardless mm -hmm. is a self-medication for pain. So, um, you know, there shouldn't be any judgment or stigma because at um, one point or another, we all go through immense amount of pain and not providing these people with the resources they need is um, usually the reason why, you know, they're not here with us anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I know that, uh, I mean, self-medication is, I personally, I think it's one of the most uh, useful and groundbreaking uh, uh, theories of the origins of addiction and the reasons for addiction uh, that there has been. I know, at least, I mean, in my life and career, seeing that change away from just being considered a problem of bad moral choices to being a problem of self-medication, which includes mental health, pain, all different kinds of pain, trauma, all of those things. And, and I think the research bears out that when you look at people who have fallen into addiction, it's pretty much those things are present. Um, and I know that's something, uh, and uh, the, something you, I'm sure you guys see when you're dealing with it on the treatment end of people coming through for detoxification. There's no yeah. doubt. All right. Go ahead. I see, I see on the mental health, I see David, you know, can talk about it that, you know, 
the, the amount of pain and the amount of, you know, suffering um, most patients that we see endure and how strong they are, not just to get through that pain, but to actually seek help. Mm-hmm. Well, and that, that um, I've talked about this before in our podcast, but uh, I think it's the Greek word agon, which means to, to be in the arena. Um, so people take opioids because they want less, less self-consciousness from loneliness causes more self-consciousness. Pain causes more self-consciousness on, on top of other things, just the difficulties of being alive. And so people often take opioids to, to lower their self-consciousness. It's an attempt to be able to bear life more when it feels unbearable in some way, like you're saying, Claire, pain or could, what, however it is. And um, it's really an attempt to be able to engage in life more. It's almost the incredible irony and why the stigma is so terrible is that actually people are trying to find a way to cope and to be in life and where it doesn't feel so overwhelming. And so, and you know, I'm horribly, people pay a consequence of that where, especially with fentanyl and everything else, the overdose rate is just mind numbing and just so, I mean, I, the amount of young people and not just young people, not of people in general, but specifically young people who have lost friend after friend after friend is, is um, it's horrible. So I'm glad we're here talking about it. And, and also changing the mythology around it, which is, is that people are trying to live better lives often and doing it the wrong way because it doesn't work. And with fentanyl, it's 10 times more dangerous, but at least we can begin to understand it better. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. When One of the things that people uh, kind of relate to this problem in a way that can be very destructive, we tend to look at it as other people's problems in a way, right? Uh, we look at it as, oh, we hear about this. And there may be some out there who have maybe not felt the sort of like sting or the the tragedy in their own life. But I think most people now with the, the numbers and the crisis that are going on, most people have either themselves, their family or someone they know has been their life's been touched by addiction. But for those who aren't, I think it's important to know that we're not talking. And well, let me put it this way. For those that aren't, I would bet you that you are, that you have been. Uh, anyone out there who thinks that their life hasn't been touched by addiction, I'll bet it has. And if you have that relative who had that weird health problem or that weird change in behavior, or you have, you know, just the, you know, I mean, I guess macro, right? Economic and other safety reasons and things. But basically uh, our lives are all touched by this. So when we think, oh, that's a problem that's out there somewhere, almost academically, and I can, you know, think about it that way. No, it's it's us. It's it's our loved ones and our neighbors and people around us. It's not some other people on some other, you know, weird uh, like addiction island somewhere. It's it's around us all the time. Yeah, I, I think nowadays, I mean, just living the in society the way we are with the homeless um, issues and uh, mental health crisis, I, I think nobody can separate themselves anymore. I think probably 30 years ago, you could say, oh, yes, I heard about somebody that had an addiction issue. I think nowadays it, it hits us, all of us, directly, indirectly, and is going to uh, affect us as a society for generations to come. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're, we're slow to learn. I mean, the I, I think in at some point in history, we're going to look back at this period, kind of like we were doing um, and in looking at the amount of opioids that were just being prescribed and given to people basically without any real discretion, as, and that's be, being reversed and pulled back. When we look at the amount of people who have overdosed I mean, and, and, you know, over 100,000 people a year, well over it, it's, it's, it's staggering. I think it's, it's, we don't even know what to do about it exactly. Um, um, but there is, there is treatment, there is help, and people get very, very confused themselves. 
and isolate, don't talk to other people about it. They feel a lot of guilt and shame. And um, if, if, if anything, and we can help people begin to understand that, that it's, and I say this to people, and I know there's two sides to this, okay? Because uh, in saying the one side of it, there's a danger in that you, you minimize it, but it's just some chemicals, okay? On one level, it is just some chemicals that people have to get off of. And on the other side, it's unbelievably dangerous and can be fatal, and that's, that's part of what we're talking about today. So you're talking about, from the humanistic side, just get off these chemicals, reach out, get some help, get off of them because they are that dangerous. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, the, the only sad part on this, David, is unfortunately, for most people, the resources are not there. And, um, you know, when you add the lack of resources for treatment with the uh, lack of resources for mental health, um, it's, um, you know, it's a death sentence for many people. Um, it, I, I think a day like today to create awareness is to whoever uh, will listen to us um, out there that can make any changes is, again, we talk about so much in our podcast, is mental health resources. Yeah. This is in the United States of America. We, all the money we have, you know, channel into homeless, into addiction, into uh, MAT drugs. If half of this money has had gone to mental health, we would not be in the shape we are today. We cannot keep treating the consequence and ignoring the, ignore the problem. Mm -hmm. Mental health should start early. Resources should start early should be available for educators on uh, schools, you know, high schools, middle schools, um, people that are able to assess a situation and provide the resources. Because just assessing the situation actually make people feel shame of who they are. I think um, when we, uh, the day like today, a uh, hashtag, we see you, is so important because as you know, we see so many patients, people don't feel seen, don't feel heard. And they end up isolate, isolating because they feel so lonely on their mm -hmm. suffering. And yeah. they end up having to mask it because what, it becomes vulnerable. Yeah. What, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about that, the hashtag we see you, as you brought that up, I think that's a great sentiment, right? Especially with awareness is first of all, are we building awareness of people's needs, right? Are we building awareness that we're aware? Oh, you know, we have a, a comment that just came in from uh, Ella Michelle. Thank you uh, for, for posting Ella. Um, she says, I have a brother who has relapsed. I should say they, I don't, I don't have an indication of anything about you as a person, Ella. So um, they say, I have a brother who has relapsed for them uh, for multiple time. He is currently in rehab again, and it affects the entire family. Um, and that's a that's a great point to put out there. Getting back to the idea that it touches everybody, you know, you don't actually have a person who gets sick in life. Usually, you have a community or you have a family, right? Who who goes through that? Um, appreciate you sharing that. And uh, anything? Let's uh, say anything we want to share there about the the effects that we're seeing, not just on individuals with this struggle of addiction directly, but those, uh, those around, I would say that the hashtag applies to them too. Those that are in support systems as well. I, I not, not, I don't want to speak for the hashtag, but anyway, get your guys, uh, maybe reactions to Ella's uh, comments and, and just how that affects uh, the caregivers and family members. David. I, I think that, um, um, just kind of dovetailing on the thing I was talking about before in terms of self-consciousness, it makes the whole family more self-conscious and, and it brings a type of pain and, and that can end up feeling like a burden for the person who's getting treatment. So, you know, we, we count on each other to, to uh, uh, for help. We count on each other to be well, you know, it's, it's a great gift when everybody, you know, in your family, your friends and so forth are all doing well enough 
and then you can sort of forget about each other and, uh, you know, and let each other be in the background knowing everybody's okay. When someone's struggling or in danger, it, it shifts everything in, in a family or in a system and it's hard on everyone. So, you know, the, the, like you're saying, Claire, the process should be really figuring out how's this person going to get better? What's working, what's not working? And, um, um, you know, and, and maybe I'll talk about this later, but opioids are a tricky, tricky drug because of the fact that they make people feel so much better initially and actually can aid in people's functioning and, and, and mimic, and I really do mean mimic, that mimics health in the beginning, okay? But then it, it goes up, it, it flattens out, and then it goes down the other side, okay? And with fentanyl, that, it, you know, the danger is so profound at all levels, but, um, but it's, it tricks the brain in some ways initially. And I think it registers deeply in the deep brain that this is okay, but it isn't, and 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 it, and it leads nowhere. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and especially when uh, we don't find or haven't found other things that help with that. Go ahead, Claire. No, that's okay. Um, and I I think like what Michelle's comment about her brother. I think there is the factor of um, understanding that sometimes he didn't fail. Sometimes the treatment failed him. Uh, again, when we go back to we see you, maybe he hasn't been seen yet. Maybe mm -hmm. he hasn't been properly diagnosed. You know, we often talk to patients that um, have been through several rehabilitation centers and uh, they just keep relapsing. And the first question is, you know, were they ever diagnosed with any emotional issues, mental health issues? You know, well, you know, when they were young, there's always something there, you know, um, did they follow with the uh, therapist? Well, not really. He just went to see, and I understand, you know, special with insurances that uh, cover such a small part of mental health. So um, most people don't go get the help they need. So they go to a rehab with, you know, 50 people. Um, they sit in meetings. Um, they often, you uh, are not seen by themselves or with somebody that can truly diagnose the issue and they leave feeling even worse because now they don't have the drug to mask the issue anymore uh they are feeling like a failure they failed the family they failed the loved ones um you know and it just snowballs and every time they relapse they it's worse and is more dangerous and they their self-esteem gets smaller it just you know this revolving door of never getting well mm -hmm. it's uh oh uh ella had uh, just commented one thing i'm at work trying to keep up we really appreciate you being here and uh you do have a follow-up for us that says uh he's done every possible drug and put it in his body in any way he can get it started with weed at the age of nine. Wow. And, and that, that highlights another problem. I think connected to what you're saying is when we haven't been seen and, and, or people don't see it at that, especially that age at that level, there's just a lot of things that, um, yeah, are very, very, uh, and it also very, very difficult. It, it, it changes, you know, the chemistry of your brain, especially somebody using, you know, for a, a lengthy amount of time, plus different drugs, it changes mm -hmm. how their brain works. So the healing process will take time too. And I think you can see where there's also the, the holdup that happens when, when we have this kind of a problem, it does mess with our development also, especially at a young age, because we have a different experience developing that can also make people feel even more distinct, more othered, if you will, um, that kind of thing. I, one thing I was thinking about um, as you were talking, uh, Claire, with the, this even this concept of just we see we see you or seeing people around us with these uh, struggles and issues. When we talk about overdose awareness, we generally associate that with death uh, because that is the biggest risk. And there's a huge epidemic of people who die. But I think if, for those who haven't been caught up in opioid uh, use 
you know, you may not be familiar with the idea or the fact that a lot of people experience overdose without dying, right? Um, and that that's something that we don't always talk about is those that survive overdose. And in some cases, the the they might have small overdose experiences that they all alone. And just by whatever, you know, grace and luck or whatever they survive. And then it's like, well, what if I had that over the weekend while I was sitting in my house alone? And I do I tell anybody, especially if I don't want them to know I was using opiates, right? Um, and now I'm just carrying that around. There's another trauma that's happening within my my use. So I think you can see that where there's more to health than just avoiding death, right? I mean, to put it frankly. Yeah, you're, you're destroying your life in the process, you know, you're destroying your relationships, you're destroying your self-esteem. I mean, there, there is so much that is involved. But if I could go back, Dwight, I think I would like David to talk about a bit more, uh, especially because Michelle is talking about her brother, uh, you know, the emotional, emotional maturity that, you know, that you miss mm -hmm. when you use drugs, you know, since a very young age. And I think, David, we talked about that a lot you know, especially with the young adults? Yeah, well, the, I mean, for, for particularly for um, um, boys, you know, uh, their brain doesn't really fully develop till they're 26 or right around there. So, it, I mean, it's a long developmental process. And, and, you know, on top of that, you're establishing, you know, so there's, there's the biology of the development of the brain and then there's also how the um, how your personality and your relationships develop, which is sustaining, you know, uh, as a as a sustaining principle. So what happens is, is when you get involved with drug use, it becomes a default dependency. So you could say that a lot of development is, is developing healthy dependency, healthy dependency on friends, family, on your capacity to learn and master things and your brain develops along these lines. It's actually evolutionarily how the brain develops is through relationships significantly, which is why treatment, ultimately treatment has to do with the depth and the way you develop a relationship with the people you're working with. And that's a long-term sustainable thing. That's not something that just happens quickly no development happens just in, in, as a short term, quick thing. You can get, you can get, you can have a good experience. It can give you momentum moving forward, but it has to, all development is a sustained process, you know, and there's many phases to it. So um, as you talk about maturity, that's, that's the, the, the process um, really for all of us. Mm -hmm. Excellent. As we're talking about awareness and uh, and advocacy as well, uh, one of the things that people can do, it sounds like we we may not think of some of these things as supporting uh, overdose, uh, you know, fighting overdose. But one of the things people can do is contribute to the local mental health aspects of their community, whether you have community mental health centers that could use volunteers or even donations or whether you're just raising awareness or even the way you vote. Right. If you vote for people who care about mental health. And so I think sometimes, once again, we view these as distinct. I, I even worked at an agency once where we had kind of the mental health part of the building and the substance abuse part of the building. And as I worked there, it was interesting how the building parts, moved, not physically, they didn't physically shove the building together, but but the parts of which therapists worked in which hallway and which clients turned right or turned left when they walk in the building, thankfully, became so much more integrated than when I first started working there. It was like, oh, you got pulled over with DUI? You go that way. Oh, you've got uh, mental health trauma? Go that way. It's like, well, it should just, it's the same way, right? I mean, we're hopefully addressing the same things. But, uh, but as far as awareness and helping people, if you're raising awareness and access to mental health care in what, what, whatever way you can, you're helping. You are helping. It's still under this banner that we're talking about, I think. Um, yeah. What else. thoughts... What thoughts do you guys have about what people can do to promote awareness and, and what is the proper way for them to observe? Um, oh, all of a sudden I channeled uh, Ebenezer Scrooge for a second. If, to keep International Overdose Awareness Day in their heart all the year long. That might sound like a weird thing to do, but a weird, thing, weird way to say it. But what can people do to raise the awareness and keep, keep that going? 
You know, um, I think we're, we're living in an age where um, we possess such technology. You know, it is so easy to spread, you know, awareness, education. Now we have AI, AI that can, uh, you know, find the most effective way to reach, especially, you know, young kids, adults, uh, young adults. Um, I think um, we need to request or in a way even demand that the social media that makes billions of dollars from us, you know, participate on this awareness, um, create those, um, you know, um, the commercials that shows how old I am. Uh, cre create uh, commercials. You know, what? What are those? <laughs> Create the messages that um, will will provide people the education they need and save, you know, some lives. I think um, we have to talk as well about um, the difference of overdose, poisoning, uh, suicide. Um, I think all of those, you know, are, are thrown in the same bucket where they are not. Uh, especially overdose and poisoning, you know, I think when we call um, overdose, uh, poisoning overdose, we're shifting, shifting the blame from the dealer to the victim, you know, and um, we are forgetting what is fueling this crisis in first place. So if you uh, put together the lack of mental health resources, you know, open borders, the influx of uh, fentanyl, uh, the lack of uh, education and awareness through our, you know, social media um, and the lack of understanding in our schools with um, young people trying drugs. Young people always tried everything, but it didn't mean that they died. It didn't mean meant they got poisoned. And I think yeah. um, we need to understand the difference. Yeah. And sometimes when people are, are, I always use this, this word when people are othered and we think of them as belonging to this other group over here, that's never gone well, historically, I should say with any group. But when we look at someone and we say, oh, there's this group of people with addiction they're over here and we treat them that way, we ignore a lot of that. And, and it's possible to be, you know, uh, to be doing some things that are unwise or self-destructive behaviors and to still have the right not to be murdered by people giving you poisonous drugs, right? I mean, it's it, that might sound very simple to say, but I think the way we carry ourselves and the way we talk about these things uh, is that we don't often call, uh, we don't call it what it is of like, oh, here's tainted or, you know, laced drugs that are laced with something that will probably kill you and I'll sell it anyway. Well, that's a murder or that's at least, you know, I mean, well, I don't know any other way to say it, legally speaking, especially, <laughs> but uh, but we don't always talk about it that way. We still talk about it in terms of like, isn't it sad that they did that, which it is sad when someone does something self-destructive. But I guess I'm just trying to say we're I'm, I'm circling back to the stigma is what I, I guess by saying that is that right. that stigma covers up a great deal of another complexity to it, which is the the recklessness with other people's lives uh, that's that's being done there and hopefully hopefully we don't contribute to the idea that we don't notice that problem because we don't value those people's lives enough as as we should if that makes yeah, sense it, it makes a huge amount of sense and i and i truly believe that um this is just gonna change when we as a society you know um shift our priorities putting the well-being, you know, of citizens above all else, above, yeah. you know, uh, political agendas, above stigma, above judgment, above, uh, you know, financial gains. The moment we, um, as a society, start seeing people um, recognizing the issues with in making well the well-being of uh, you know our citizens a priority i think things will change right 
Yeah, I, I have a good friend of mine who, who had a friend whose son was thriving at college, did not have any history of addiction, did one line of coke at a party one night just to mess around with some friends and laced with fentanyl and died just tragically. So it's and, and not that his life or anyone else's life is more or less important, whether they're not they're struggling with addiction or not, it doesn't matter. Right. But I, and I bring this up so everybody understands just how dangerous it is. I don't I mean, because part of what we're doing today is bringing awareness to the level of danger. So you're talking about just just uh, a, a young a young kid messing around. Not not mm -hmm. and not thinking he's going to not even thinking it's going to be destructive or dangerous, just thinking he's, you know, he's going to get high for a, for an hour or whatever it is. And OK, and I get it. You're still taking a risk or whatever, but not the risk you're imagining. Right. It's and so it's it's changed. Um, and I think it's you know, and I point this out specifically so that people understand just just and that like you're saying claire that's poisoning okay that that people are being poisoned that's not that's a whole different thing than has existed at any other time that i've seen um in my lifetime it that um i did not hear about or see that type of thing going on um so uh so it's dangerous yeah we we, we actually treated um a young adult um, a couple months ago, David, um, that um, the, the, his brother um, was, was actually um, did very well with treatment and uh, stayed off drugs for over two years and uh, started college and had anxiety issues, but uh, was just, you know, flourishing and um, was actually in Santa Barbara, uh, and uh, one of the nights he was at a friend's house, and his anxiety just uh, started. And can you guys see me? Yeah, uh, I can hear you. Yeah. And uh, a friend um, offered him a Xanax, and the Xanax had fentanyl in it, mm. and that was the end of that. And uh, this was somebody that was doing, you know, wonderfully uh, that uh, was fighting his demons, um, was in school. And after two years of just, you know, succeeding in every part of his life, you know, a lot of effort. One Xanax, mm -hmm. you know, took away his future. It, it is the reality we're living in today is... Um, it is so tragic and is so preventable. Yeah. And, and people are just not talking about it enough. You know, we have a question that, that popped up here from Marina that I think ties it very much in with what you're saying. Uh, thank you, Marina. How valid are my concerns about everything potentially being laced with fentanyl nowadays? My 14 year old son doesn't take me seriously when I warn him about the dangers, even with vapes he might get uh, from his friends. And that's, you know, that's that's the thing uh, we're kind of historically used to if someone's like, well, I'm hanging with friends or I'm going to get a little high or, or be a little, you know, rebellious or things like that. Um, it's never been more dangerous than that. And the idea that, you know, oh, I, and when you're in that mode of addictive use, you don't necessarily think, let me be careful what I'm putting in my body. We just don't think of it that way. Um, so first, uh, what are your guys thoughts about this first part of the question? How valid are those concerns? When we're saying it, maybe yeah. someone's like, oh, really? Come on. I, I wish I had the data because I, I was reading about it last week. And um, but um, the, the amount of like the Percocets out there, um, mm -hmm. when I say out there, I mean that you don't buy from a pharmacy. Um, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's nearly 80 percent of them has fentanyl traces in it. So wow. uh, of the illicit of the illicit yeah. ones. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I so can tell. It's. Uh, go ahead. 
It's real. And I think that's what I, I go back to AI and I go back to, I mean, these kids are stuck to their phones, TikTok, uh, not Facebook anymore, but Instagram. Uh, you know, everybody talks about, you know, how they want to help, uh, especially the, the social media, you know, the heads of the social media. This is it. Reach out for these kids. Make mm-hmm. uh, videos. Make uh any kind of effort um, of, uh, you know, things that will educate them, things that will, they, they will believe you're talking to them, things that um, they will take it as the truth because parents can say whatever they want. And yeah. historically, kids say, oh, you don't understand me. Right. Well, and also, you know, the the, the quality of fake fill in the blank nowadays is it's better. I mean, that even crosses industry, right? You could say with anything, knock off anything. And so that definitely applies to drugs. You have pill presses, you have, you can go online and see what different, you can look up and see what a Xanax looks like if you want to sell Xanax, but you don't have any and you might be able, I haven't done this, so I don't mean to, but you know, there's ways that you can make something look like something or the other side of that. Yeah. the, the ones, the illicit ones, would look pretty perfect. Yeah, especially when they're fake opiates made. And I had uh, read something the other day, and this was uh, amongst the. Let me so let me subpopulation. The DEA, as they've seized street dr- drugs and they've tested them, obviously some of them are not opioids. They are the pills that people are buying. Some of the pills were fake. They were mostly fentanyl. And of that group, so shrink it down, subpopulation of that. Of that group of uh, of the fake pills that had fentanyl in them, it was one in six that were fatal for just about anybody. If you took that pill, right. you die. Right. Okay. And so that's there. And and the industrialization and the people having tools and being able to. So, for example, when I was a kid, nobody was like, hey, I got this vape cartridge that doesn't really have a lot of smell and appearance to it, but it's got pot in it. Woo. It was like. There were certain, you know, just just practical restraints of people being able to get a hold of things that obviously didn't even exist when I was a kid. But but to have that now and say, oh, my friend has this cartridge. They say it has this in it. They were told that by whoever gave it to them, who might have been told that by whoever they bought it from. And so it may have passed through several pairs of hands that don't know that it may have toxic additional elements to it. Um, and so we don't really know what it is. And, and as we put it before, this is the most dangerous time we've had in. I don't know, my lifespan, uh, to do that without knowing for sure where something came from. And when you're buying things illicitly, you never really know for sure where they came from. Let's be honest. You know. Right. And and that I was talking to somebody uh, recently in, in a, uh, who had just gotten off of opioids, and they were talking about how hard it was to the whole process of being on them and so forth. And they were saying, I don't, I could never do this again. And I'm not, you, but you know, if I ever did, that would be it for me. I just would, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't manage going through all of this again. And I would just kind of throw in the towel. I, I would just die on right. opium type thing. And I, and, and that's not the first time I've heard that. I've heard that many times because one, the cycle does really, um, tire people out more more than they imagine okay but but here's the other side of it all while awareness is critical it's not enough if you ask me so part of what i said to him is i said the 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 hell you the hell that's the case you're not going to die on it you get off of you get off of the damn chemicals no matter what i don't want you to ever have to go through that again because it's nothing but hard on you there's 10 times better options than that. And, and so, but, but it's critical that we use our anger, not punitively, not to make people feel badly about themselves, but to help them understand how to use that protectively. Because there is an inability, and one of the things that happens is a stigma with this, is there's too much, there's too much, um, kind of like shaking your 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 finger at people for doing badly than rather using that intensity to truly help them get in stay in feel deserving and and um and use that intensity protectively and they need that and 
So awareness begins it, but there has to be even a deeper commitment, a more intense commitment. And that's really how people get better from what I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting how the, another facet to awareness that we're talking about is people finding out information. And it's funny because nowadays, whenever we use the phrase, I don't really know a lot about that. Uh, one of the things we have to remember is that's optional nowadays for good or for bad. I mean, the technology and all those things have a lot of downsides, but if my, uh, if my friend or spouse or child is going through something, you know, I can figure out and learn more about it. Or if I just want to be one of those people who's more aware, Google some stuff, sit down now. Yeah. Be careful. But you know, if you get into some of those, uh, those places, the, some of the, uh, uh, national organizations or some of the major clinics or some of those or email uh you know email us at our podcast we'll make sure to answer your question too but uh, you know there's resources out there is what i mean i mean just look up addiction podcast there's there's a number of us out there right and so there's different uh things that you can do to learn and to be aware and raising awareness can mean uh you know, doing stuff. And as you put it, David, I think that raising awareness can launch into actually doing things about it to help. Um, on the other side of awareness is raising our personal awareness. Even if that's all that uh, we start out with is also good because if we know something, we're going to tend to do something or we're going to want to do something, which can then lead to doing something. Right. So. Yes. Yes. You, 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 if you're going to get better at anything, I mean, as, as we we're saying, it's developmental. So you you grow out of you grow you grow out of everything, right? So to get better in anything is a growing process. To grow and really develop in anything is a prolonged, sustained commitment. Yeah, um, I think, I think uh, being I think creating awareness is. Um, being part of something bigger than yourself, um, you know, being less self-involved and more, you know, involved on uh, on society, on helping others, I think makes you feel good. I think mm -hmm. it makes you productive. Yeah. Um, I think especially... We lost uh, is just a few of the words you were saying, Claire. Um, you were talking about, I think, that sense of community and that, uh, you know, that sense of that connection that people have, I think. And, and then we lost a little bit of what you were saying. We have you back on yet? If we don't, then that's happens as well. I, I'll just add on to what you're saying there with that sense of togetherness that people also do crave. Um, I've heard it said recently that, uh, you know, we run into a lot of things in our world and in our field with these kinds of things that have to do with what they call what they usually call self-help and how there's really no self-help. It's really uh, there always is a community, a community of professionals and treatment people that we are relying on, a community of family and basically just the people, the people that are around us. So um, let's see as we're as we're coming close on uh, on it for today. Is there anything else we want to uh, say before we wrap up today? David, do you have any uh, parting words of wisdom? <laughs> I don't know about that, but I mean, <laughs> it's, it's um, what, what I would say is um, might seemingly sound like a contradiction to what I just said, you know, so, so we're, because we're dynamic uh, beings, part of it is we need to be able to take things seriously, work at them hard, you know, and, and do them. But then, you know, like when, when a treatment is working well, I would say you go into the, the session, you, there's a period of self-consciousness, you're working things at a certain level. And then you get up, you walk out the door, you close the door and you can forget about it all for a while. Because a lot of times what people are taking drugs for is to forget about things, to make life feel a little less, to make it a little easier, to be able to feel like they can play some and forget some. 
And that's just as critical. So, so in a good treatment, there's this back and forth between engaging, growing, being handling enough self-consciousness, and then the opportunity to sort of shut that door, walk out, forget about things for a while. And until that dynamic gets sort of, you get comfortable with both aspects of that. So maybe that's, that's uh, a place for me to leave it. Very good. Well, uh, hopefully everybody out there, and thank you so much for those that listened, whether uh, we're, whether you're joining us during the live time or whether you're joining us in the future as this video is floating around. It uh, doesn't matter. We love you and we're glad that you're here and glad that you're the kind of person, uh, I think you're showing yourself and showing hopefully those around you that you are the kind of person who wants to be aware and engaged and helpful with the, the issues of addiction just by tuning in, just by uh, educating yourself and and by joining this community of awareness that we're trying to promote. And I'll just echo one last thing about what David was saying too. I think that uh, awareness is great, but then hopefully that awareness will motivate behavior, behaviors that we will do and go out and, and help. And that's the only way these things are going to happen. So um, as uh, as we sign off for today, just want to remind everybody the podcast that uh, we we host on a regular basis is uh, Addiction Recovery and Mental Health, which is a podcast uh, by the the Wiseman Method medically assisted opioid treatment programs and for uh, rapid detox as well. And we talk about lots of things that have to do with that. We love to hear from you as well. If you have questions or thoughts you'd like to hear us address, because uh, like I said, we want to keep awareness and education going all the time, uh, year round. So definitely hit us up, uh, info at opiates.com. Opiates.com is the website as well. Lots of information there. And you can get to add us on all social medias at opiates as well. So thanks again. And thank you. Uh, we lost Claire just a second ago before we end up, but uh, thank you, David. And uh, glad to be with you today. Yeah, glad to be with you. And thank you, Dwight, as always. And, um, and goodbye to Claire. Uh, and um, it's, it's always good to, to have these discussions. I appreciate it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much to everybody. And we will be back with you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.